Greensboro, Tennessee. We met at the teaching assistance orientation and I walked in, I didn't know anyone and I was so excited, like a little kid at their first day at school and I was introducing myself to everyone and then I sat down next to this very handsome man who was very frantically trying to finish something and I said, hey, I'm a copy and he's like, ugh. Oh. Uh, I had deleted my syllabus by accident and was trying to rewrite it. It was due um, in, you know, 10 minutes. So I was trying to recreate this thing and when I first met Agape, I, I could only think about work. Afterwards, he came up to me and apologized for <laughs> his behavior. If I've hurt you in any way, advertently or inadvertently, advertently or inadvertently, I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your forgiveness. And we talked and... I think we spent eight, nine hours together on our first date. Mm -hmm. um, and that was... Halloween. Yeah, yeah, Halloween now, almost five years ago now. Uh, in the United States, one third of all weddings are between individuals from different root traditions. And I've been doing this for 10 years and um, my work, I, I mean, I keep three other people busy besides myself with the work that I do because there's such a huge demand for uh, non-traditional ceremonies. Of course, they're not all interfaith. I, you know, they're certainly the spiritual but not religious. They're the humanists and the, those who call their ceremonies civil. I've done Chinese tea ceremonies and Eastern Orthodox crowning ceremonies and Buddhist meditation as part of a ceremony. I've done Hindu ceremonies walking around Saptapati and various combinations of all of this. And it's increasing, there's no doubt about it. There are more and more couples who are from different backgrounds who are trying to find a way to bridge that gap. The usual pressure in the past has been for one person to adopt the spirituality of the partner. And yet, that creates an interesting discussion. Who's going to adopt whose ways and why? Is one right? Is one wrong? And that's not a discussion that I think is really very fruitful when we have very vibrant traditions all coming together in this context of a melting pot. More and more, I find myself thinking about children mm. um, and about how to give my kids a sense of Jewish identity to complement a sense of Greek identity, which I feel is going to be almost effortless um, because of how traditional the community is, because of how large it is, because of how um, natural uh, uh, those identity-defining elements are. You're surrounded by the music and the food and, and uh, the majority of your relatives, you know. Um, and in that environment, uh, my, you know, my family is much smaller. Um, my own upbringing and my own ways of being Jewish are not as, um, I don't have a good word for it, not necessarily as overt. Young couples with young children are definitely more interested in looking at both their home traditions and alternatives to their home traditions once they have children in the picture. Um, some of them do try to do, you know, like Christmas and Hanukkah and, you know, do all the family things from both sides of the family. Um, a lot of them look at things like the Unitarian Church and other options. And um, I do think there is uh, an opening to create a, a, more of a community for couples and young children who are wanting something even broader than that. It's not a question of Jewish or Greek. This is the real challenge. It's, it's finding a way of making them feel as Greek as they are Jewish, as Jewish as they are Greek. Now we begin to define interspirituality. And the question is, interfaith versus interspiritual, uh, there is a, a very porous border between that and what is interspirituality, but finding the common Together. roots, the common essence of different traditions. Two families. 
Uh, Dad, I have a question for you. With the glass, should we put it in the yeah, satin yeah. bag and then stomp on the satin bag? Okay. Yeah, the final tradition that Gape and Aaron wish to honor, honor is, uh, with one another is a shared one again. The breaking of glass. The breaking of the glass in the Greek tradition is a break with the past and stepping into the unknown of her future. Breaking of the glass in the Jewish tradition, they're, they're breaking any barriers that would separate them. Taking elements of diverse traditions and stacking them in a, in a way that allows them to speak to one another without having to either, without having to mirror one another, so that you get this dialogue in the ritual. There was a deep richness, a conversation on a, a metaphysical, ritual, mythic level. And of course, what results from the children of those kinds of marriages is a new form of spirituality <coughs> that uh, they're exposed to. They can't choose and say, mom or dad, or one of them is right and one of them's wrong. They begin to learn multiple ways of expressing a relationship, a spiritual relationship based on the backgrounds of, that are brought together. We raised Aaron Jewish, but he always had an advantage over other people because he had another family who was Christian. I mean, the fact is, I didn't come from one tradition. My father was Catholic, my mother was Protestant. And because of my parents, I kind of grow, I, I, and no reason why, I kind of thought that, of course you chose your own religion when you got to be an adult. Agapi's mother, Vicky, as soon as Agapi said that uh, she was dating a Jewish man, um, brought up all kinds of questions. Well, when I finally shared with my mother that I was dating Aaron and and filled in his background, who his people are, all of those necessary details. She kind of paused and said, oh, he's a Jewish boy? And, and then she started telling me about how difficult that would be, and she's right. We weren't expecting her to marry a Greek boy, but to get married in the Greek Orthodox Church was very important to us. That's the way we grew up, this is our religion, it was hard, it was tough. I mean, to this day, it's still tough, but it was her choice. In her mind, it's so difficult and challenging about a Greek Orthodox woman marrying a Jewish man is, um, has everything to do with the tradition, starting with marriage. Like, if, if you marry a Jewish man, then you can't get married in the church, and that means it would be difficult for your kids to be baptized in the church, and they're, um, she, I think she was just afraid of me being ostracized by the Greek community. I, I've had situations where uh, one or the other's whole family doesn't show up and it's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, I, the one I'm thinking of is a couple who were, um, he was Hindu, she's Christian, her family was outraged not because she was also because she was marrying a Hindu but because he had dark skin. So she had two strikes against her and her side of and this was at a chapel, and her side of the family were not present. First time I came to visit, um, I, we went to Mike's wedding, and a Greek wedding is, Mike is Akapi's brother, and it was huge, 400 people just about, uh, and a, a glendy that went on until, I thought the cops were gonna come, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, everyone spoke Greek almost 90% of the time. Um, so I felt, I don't think I understood uh, um, how big the culture gap was uh, until, until Mike's wedding. I wasn't surprised that he married outside of his religion. He's still not going to be any less Jewish. How he found a Greek girl, I'm not sure I understand that, but we live in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. There's very few Jews there. I'm sure we'll all be surprised with feelings we don't know where they came from. But uh, on the whole, I have a positive outlook on it. Mm -hmm.
about two people who come out of the same philosophical frame. You know, they, they really do have, their, their belief systems are very similar. What they believe about life, about the divine, about the nature of self and all of that, they really have that in common. In fact, I think the ceremony that we've created is a really good example. There may have been a lot of negotiation involved in creating that ceremony, but I actually don't feel as if anything has been abandoned. Um, I, you know, the metaphor that I, that I go to in thinking about how these traditions, or, or, or you know, how these Agape's word with challenges uh, play out, I think of wrestling. I think of, you know, uh, Jacob wrestling with God. When they went around the table, it was quiet. No, no one was singing, no priest to say the blessings that we usually say. Isaiah Horeb said. Uh, it was just a quiet time. So is that, were you sad because that was missing? Yes, yeah. a little so bit, yes, I was. I was a what, little sad. For me, it was more a coming to terms with my own belief system and not really listen to any of the outside voices telling me, I don't know, that I would be an outsider and I wouldn't be accepted anywhere. And I just had to come to terms with what I believed in. You know that you're fully engaged um, with issues of faith and culture and love and, and family when you wrestle. I am sacrificing to some extent that part of my identity that is so involved in this community. All of these assumptions that I would get married in the Greek church and have my kids baptized that now I don't know if that I mean, obviously, we're not getting married in the Greek Orthodox Church, but I don't know if my children will be baptized. I don't know if that's possible. My hope is that they will be baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church. If that's allowed and... Allowed by the church? By the church. Yeah. I mean, I... We have a few priests that, because Agape is a, a Greek Orthodox uh, member, that there won't be a problem. But not everybody is accepting of that. But what the kind of life that I've been living with Aaron and that we want to build together is so rich and complex and it's just home to me. It just feels right, even though I went through so much pain, I guess, trying to get there. <laughs> okay, you can hold that. Nice. And when you get mad at each other, make up and make up quick. I love the differences and what makes us unique, but we also share a lot of the same core values like um, respect for each other and personal integrity and a passion for what we do in our, in our professions. It's honesty, integrity, passion, and compassion. Mm -hmm. Those are the four kind of core principles. Right, that we try to, I think both of us uh, um, have tried to live by. And, then. and also, I mean, there's the, the silliness that we both really value in each other. We do have a private language of gestures that grows up only between people who are in a really intimate, loving relationship. And that's a really rich and beautiful thing. And hopefully we'll all learn something from all of us. There's so much we have in common. To see them happy together, to see them in, in love, to see them say the words that they wrote to each other. They, were, they looked very happy, and I know they're very happy. They love each other. I think it definitely has opened my heart doing this work. Certainly having the opportunity to be close and really get to know in a deep way these individuals who are choosing to, um, against all odds, I guess you might say, some of them, you know, uh, ally themselves for the long run. We are crossing borders, and there almost are no real borders anymore. Well, that's what's happening as we get to know people of different faiths. They're just human beings, just like us.